Let's begin our message time with a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, let your word, which is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder the soul and spirit and joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our heart, let it have full effect on each of us today. Convict us of sin, encourage us, challenge us, whatever the case may be. Let your spirit reign in each of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in the book of John, and we're looking at Jesus, just trying to fall in love with him all over again. We're in chapter 11, which looks at Lazarus, and Jesus declares, I am the resurrection and the life. We're going to read a passage and then look at a portion of it, and then continue uh, when I get back. But let's read this together. John eleven seventeen through 37. And let, in respect for God's word, let's stand as we read together. <clears throat> so when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews had joined the women around Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Now Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And when she had said these things, she went her way and secretly called Mary her sister. The teacher has come and is calling for you. As soon as she heard that, she rose quickly and came to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the town, but was in the place where Martha met him. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and comforting her, when they saw that Mary rose up quickly and went out, followed her, saying, She is going to the tomb to weep there. Then when Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him? And some of them said, Could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind also have kept this man from dying? The Lord had his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. It was a terrible time in the 1870s in Minnesota. What had happened during this time uh, is a massive attack of Rocky Mountain grasshoppers. We call them locusts or that sort of thing. And for five years, the The state was overrun with them. It was so bad, it was devastating all the agriculture. 
the governor at one point ordered every man to take one day a week and devote himself to nothing but getting rid of grasshoppers. That, that, that meant swatting them or, or finding their larvae and kill them. I mean, some people dug wide trenches, filled it with tar in hopes that crawling through they'd get stuck and then they'd burn it. I mean, it was devastating. Five years. Finally, in the fifth year, the governor, uh, John Pillsbury, I believe it was his name, ordered a day of fasting and prayer, April 26th of 1876. And so it was strange, but he ordered every man, woman, and child. So schools were closed, businesses were closed, and they dedicated themselves to fasting and prayer. Deal with the grasshoppers, oh God. Deal with them because it's going to wipe us out. The very next day, the temperature in Minnesota rose to midsummer temperatures. It got hot for Minnesota. And the next day, it was hotter. And you know what happened? The people began to panic because all the larvae from the grasshoppers hatched and came out. Billions of them. And they were going, what in the world is going on? Forty four days in a row of record heat and all these grasshopper larvae. And on the fifth day, you know what happened? A massive frost hit the countryside. Snow, it killed all the larvae. God answers prayer. But he doesn't always do it in the way that we think he should. Oh, we talked about that last week, didn't we? He often doesn't do it in the time that we want as well. But anyone who reads this passage has to understand that principle. God's ways are not our ways, nor are his thoughts our thoughts. God does things his way, but he does answer prayer. In this passage, we have to understand all that's going on. This is the culmination of Jesus' ministry in terms of miracles. This is his last sign. And with every sign, with every miracle, his opposition grew. Back in chapter 5, you know, when Jesus healed the man and had him walk on the Sabbath, people didn't like it. There was opposition. Chapter 6, you look at it, where Jesus claims to be the bread of life. Many of those who followed Jesus ceased following him at that point. In chapter 7, at the Feast of Tabernacles, he proclaims his teaching, and the people largely reject. Chapter 8, he declares, I am the living Son of God. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac. And the people didn't believe it. Chapter 9, he proves it. He heals the, the blind man, gives him sight, proving he is the light of the world. And what happens to the leadership? Uh, they're very much opposed. Chapter 10, he says, I am the good shepherd, and he shows that he is the good shepherd. And then in chapter 11, he verifies every single thing that he had said because he raises a person from the dead who is really, really dead. You remember that from last week. And so we're in the middle of this. But the story is not just about his rejection. We'll get more into that in the end of the chapter. It's about meeting the needs of people and where they are. Today what we see is how Jesus ministered to Mary and Martha. It's interesting the way that he ministered to them. And it gives us an example that we're to ministering to people, not just in moments of grief, but in every aspect of life, how we're to do it. You see, the issues that Mary and Martha dealt with, are the same issues we deal with. 
Why, God, didn't you come when I called? Why, God, didn't you do what I asked you to do when I ask? And Jesus deals with that. And we see that today. In verses 20 through 27, we see Jesus encountering Martha in his ministry to her. He's outside of Bethany. She hears he's come, and she, she somehow gets away from the crowd that's around there, and she goes out to see Jesus. And, and the first thing that she does is, is share her frustration. If only you had done what I said when I said it, this would never have happened. No, those aren't the wor exact words she used. Lord, if you'd been here, he, my brother wouldn't have died. Just what we say to God as well. I mean, it was, it was halfway blaming Jesus for her brother's death. Wasn't it? I mean, it's your fault he's dead because if you'd been here, he'd be alive right now. When, when you got our message, why didn't you come if you had just got on your horse? Things would be different. But at the same time, I mean, here's Martha struggling. I mean, you, you see her faith. But I know, Lord, that whatever you ask now, God will do. I don't know if she even knows what she's saying at this point. Not because she doesn't believe he's going to resurrect him. Uh, because, you know, when he even talks about it, you know, she kind of debates him at this point. But, you, you know, uh, I'm the resurrection and the life. Well, I know my brother will be raised in the end, in the judgment. The, the Jewish people, many of them struggled with the concept of death and what happened after death. The, the Sadducees didn't even believe that there was life after death, or if it was, it was some sort of nebula sheol where you're kind of cloudy figures or shadowy figures or something like that. They, they really didn't believe that. The Pharisees, on the other hand, believed in a literal life after death and a literal resurrection. So it, it appears that Mary was of this sword, sort because she believed in the Word of God, and she believed that there was a resurrection. Job believed in a resurrection. You remember what he said? For I know that my Redeemer lives. And, and so as a result, the Old Testament taught that there would be a resurrection and that there's life. She believed in that. She believed in the Son of God. She accepted Jesus' statement and took it to heart. She was a conflicted woman in grief at this point. And Jesus ministers to her. Look how Jesus did this. Martha was an engineer. Well, I take that because I believe she was an, the oldest and lived by that, you know, was a doer and all that. So how did Jesus minister to an engineer. You know what engineers want? The facts. Give me the facts. I mean, we'll figure this out. A lot of men are this way. Some women as well. Just give me the fact. So you know what Jesus did? He gave her the truth. He ministered to her where she was at, and he spoke the truth into her life. Martha had expressed her disappointment in Jesus and her frustration and her doubts. And Jesus, in turn, told her the truth. Now, none of us have ever done what Martha has done. Well, maybe none of you, but I have. You know, doubting him, doubting his promises, doubting the certainty of it all. You know what Jesus says to her in essence? He says, I am exactly what Lazarus needs right now, and I'm exactly what you need right now. Now, did she understand that totally? No, no, she didn't at all. 
important because Lazarus is going to rise again. And Jesus knew what he was going to do. He was going to raise him from the dead right then. But Martha, being the logical one, the engineer, oh, I know in the end, and all this other stuff. And Jesus says, no, 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 you don't get it. You don't get it. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection. It's not something future. It's something that's right now. Oh, yeah, it's future as well. But what Martha is doing is declaring her Orthodox Jewish faith that there is coming a resurrection. And there is coming a resurrection. I hope you all know that. There is a resurrection coming when everyone will be resurrected, either to be with Jesus forever or to face judgment. That is going to happen. But Jesus had more in mind than that. What does it mean? What was Jesus saying when he said, I am the resurrection? You know what that means to me? It means he's the source of all life. He gives life, he takes it away. He can restore it. Everything that He is. He is the one who has the power to obliterate death. And He will one day. You know what He's going to do to death? He's going to throw it into the lake of fire. That's going to happen. He's over it all. And He has the power to give life and sustain life. I'm the resurrection and life. There's a lot of debate on what that word life means at this point. Some people say it's physical life. Well, 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 truly, Jesus can give physical life. We know that. He raised a number of people from the dead. But I think it means a whole lot more than that. When you look at the word that's used here for life and, and read it in context throughout Scripture, life can mean physical life. It can mean spiritual life. It can mean quality of life. It has a number of different meanings. But when Jesus says he is life, I think of John 10.10. 10. I am come that they might have life and have it in abundance. In abundance. That's not just physical life. That's spiritual life. That's quality. It's all of them thrown together. And when Jesus declares himself to be the resurrection and the life, he's declaring himself to be the God who is to be worshipped as the one who is all things. We have a tendency to look on this life and think that's what it's all about. Let me tell you, this life is nothing. This life is the gateway to life. This is the land of death. And you know what death is? Death is the gateway to life. Life with Jesus, if you know him. I like the words of Edward the Confessor. He said, Weep not, I shall not die. And as I leave the land of dying, I trust to see the blessings of the Lord in the land of the living. So we're incorrect to call this life. This is death. What we're experiencing now is death, not life. Life is yet to come. And so we need to understand that. The greatest miracle that Jesus performed was not raising Lazarus from the dead. You know what the greatest miracle is? It's his power to give everlasting spiritual life. To a bunch of sinners who don't deserve it. That's the greatest miracle. So Jesus encourages Martha. And she goes her way. And then Jesus encounters Mary. Now it's interesting. You know what Martha does when she leaves Jesus? She goes ministers for Jesus to Mary. She goes find her. And, and she says... The master is calling for you. Yeah. And so what does she do? You know, Mary was back in the house. Martha 
can I say, snuck out to be with Jesus? Um, Mary just got up and left, and what happened? The whole troop followed. You, you understand in, in the first century, in Jewish custom, when a relative died, the ladies were expected to go every day for a week and mourn at the tomb. That was just expected. That was normal grieving practice. So when she gets up, everybody says, Mary is going to the tomb. We all need to go to the tomb and weep with her. You understand that they actually had pave, paid grievers, uh, people who could cry on command. And you paid them to go with you. That, that showed how much you loved them when people cried a lot, you know, at the, at the tomb. And so the rich people especially would pay people to come and cry with them. I think it's stupid. But, <laughs> but that's what they did. So she got up, and she went to Jesus. And you know what she did? She did the exact same thing as Martha. She shared her grief. She shared her grief with Jesus. And you know what she says? And these are the only words recorded in Scripture by Mary. It's the exact same words as Martha. Lord, if you'd gotten on your horse and you'd come here, my brother wouldn't be dead. Exact same words. Nothing different. The same doubts, the same everything, but it's kind of interesting because Mary's approach is different because everybody is different. Uh, Mary came as a very sen uh, sensitive, emotional person who was emotionally overwhelmed with all that was going on with the loss of her brother. It it's interesting that in the three encounters that we see of Mary in Scripture, you know what she does in all three? Go to Jesus' feet. Every one of them, she's at his feet. You hear Martha talking directly. I see her standing and looking at Jesus eye to eye. Mary is where? At the feet of Jesus weeping. Interesting. So Jesus ministers to Mary. He does it differently. Rather than talking to an engineer, he's talking to an emotionally grieving woman. And you know how Jesus ministers to someone who is going through emotional stress? He shares her emotions. He's empathetic with her. The Apostle Paul in Romans 12 says, Rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those that weep. And that's exactly what Jesus did. An engineer, I hope you know I'm not against engineers. I'm just typecasting. I hope you all understand that. You get an engineer around somebody that's crying, and you know what they want to do? What do they want to do, Julie? They want to get out of the room as fast as they can. And, or they want to say, well, if you hadn't done this or that, it would have been okay. Or here's the way you get out of the situation. An engineer solves the problem. Am I right in this? I mean, I think I am. I heard all the engineer's wives go, amen. <laughs> Is that what Jesus did? No. He had great empathy. When she cried, he cried. And I imagine, this is sheer imagination on my part, that when Mary came and said these words to Jesus, she didn't say, Lord, if only you had been here, my brother would not have been dead. She said, Lord, if, if only, if only you, you, Lord, you get the drift? I think hers was a very emotional appeal to Jesus. I mean, 
and it affected him. And yet, here he was affected by emotions, and he knew exactly what he was about to do. He's about to call Lazarus forth from the dead. And yet he had time and feeling to the point that he wept. Shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. Why did he weep? There's actually two terms here for the emotions that Jesus shared. Uh, in the New English translation, it says Jesus was intensely moved. Uh, the, the interesting thing is when you study that term in Greek, the word normally is a stern warning. It's the term that's used of being scolding or even being angry. And some translations actually translate this word, Jesus became angry. And then it says he was greatly distressed. This is the same word that's used when Herod heard that a baby had been born. Greatly distressed. It's the same word used when the disciples were on the sea and it was wavy and they became greatly distressed. It's the same word that is used when Jesus is in the garden praying and it says he was greatly distressed. It's a word of intenseness. Not necessarily of sympathy and empathy, but of strong emotions. Uh, and, and he began to weep. And, and I imagine this wasn't just a tear dripping down the eye. This was an emotional, physical expression that he was going through. And, and, and for the third time, the people cry out when they see Jesus weeping. Surely he must have really loved this guy. Wow. And Jesus did. But why did Jesus cry? Why did he weep? He knew what he was going to do. There's various explanations. John Piper and others, uh, they seem to think that Jesus was weeping not for remorse of sorrow of death, but his tears were actually in anger at all those who didn't have the faith to believe what was going on. And so his tears were an, a reaction. And that, that's where the anger and everything, at those who didn't believe. Others see Jesus as being angry and mad and upset at death and the sorrow that it causes others. Still others say that Jesus was mad and angry and upset and wept because they were forcing him to do a miracle. He was being used and abused. The most popular interpretation is that Jesus was moved with deep empathy. Isn't he an empathetic high priest? Isn't that what Hebrews 4.16 says? For we have not a high priest that cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Now, I can see any of those. I, I can understand. I lean towards the last. Uh, but that's my opinion. But I can understand the others. Jesus wept. Well, how do I apply this to our lives? There's more we have to say about Lazarus, and it'll be in a couple of weeks when I get back from Peru. But how's my life going to be different from what we see? Uh, how do I become a better disciple? How do I fall in love with Jesus all over again? How do I put into effect the things that we're talking about? Here are a couple of things. A couple of things. Let's be like Jesus. Meet people where they are, just like Jesus did. We have a tendency, 
human tendency to expect people to react and do exactly as we are. So if we are engineers, we expect everyone to act just like an engineer. If you're a teacher, you expect everybody to exact, uh, react just like a, a teacher. If you are emotionally sensitive, you expect everybody to react what? With emotions and all this. Gary Chapman, some of you have read his book, The Five Love Languages, have, have most of you heard that? Um, in it, he says that we convey our love by one of five basic things. Um, gifts, service. By the way, that's my love language is service. So when I go home and I work at my mother's house, I'm saying to my mother, what? I love you. And when I'm in Peru this week doing projects around my daughter's house, what am I saying? I love you. Gifts. I'm not a gifts person. Do I like gifts? Oh, yes. But it, does it really just turn my crank? And the answer is, no, it doesn't. It's a gift. Yeah, that's okay. Great. You want to impress me? Come mow my grass. Man, that's an act of love. Well, what Chapman is trying to convey is the very thing what Jesus is saying. Talk to people in their love language. Not everyone has my love language. And so when I am around someone who has, whose love language is words of affirmation, what do I need to do? Affirm them with words. When I'm around someone that... That, that conveys love in physical touch. I'll, I'll shake their hand, pat their shoulder. Uh, I'll put my arm around and give them a little hug. You know, that conveys love to them. We have to meet people where they are and can't expect people to, to look and act just like us. I read the story, and I've shared it here before, uh, about the lady who lost her six-year-old daughter. And a friend of hers who also had a six-year-old daughter came over and they were talking and the mom was sitting there crying. So the, the little six-year-old girl crawled up in this mother's lap. And afterward, her mother asked this little six-year-old girl, what did you do with her? And the little girl said, I cried with her. That's what we need to learn is to be with people where they are. That, that means we cannot live in isolation. We, we have to get to know each other. We have to know which language they speak. And some of us have no idea what the other language is. Husbands, especially other wives, they have no idea what their wives say. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, they hear the words. They know what the words are but they have no idea. And that's the way it is in the body of Christ. We need to relate and then communicate where a person is emotionally, spiritually, and all others. If you want to sum it up, serve people in the way they best feel served. That's the way to do it. That's what Jesus did. To Martha, he was an engineer. To Mary, he was an empathizer, sympathizer, sharing his emotions. And I know some people will say, real men don't cry. Let me tell you this. Jesus was a real man. And he could be moved. So guys, get over it. Been there, done that, okay? Second thing, we need to become like Jesus in meeting needs of others. How did Jesus deal with things? The first thing he did is he listened. When Mary and Martha jumped out at him, Lord, if you'd only been here, my brother would not have died. He, we do not see him lecturing. What do you mean? I got plan. I mean, we don't see him correcting them. He listened. And you know what our tendency is when people are sharing things with us? To not listen. 
because we've already solved their situation. The vast majority of people already know what their problem is, vast majority. They don't need to be rehearsed what their problem is and how to solve it. You know what they need is someone who will listen to them. So the next time someone starts sharing a problem, don't jump to the conclusion and try to share with them what they got to do. Listen. Empathize with them. That's why James says, be quick to what? Listen. To hear. And slow to open your mouth. You know what we do? Our, our human tendency, open mouth, insert foot. I mean, uh, open mouth. You got my drift? The first thing you do is listen and empathize. The second thing is empathize. Can you really empathize with people? Can you wear their moccasins for a few moments? Can you weep with them if they're weeping? Can you rejoice with them over the fact that they just won the lottery? I struggle because I'm jealous. I wonder why God gave it to them and not me. Can we just rejoice with them, weep with them, laugh with them, get caught up in their, their emotions? The third thing Jesus did is he provided for their needs. Where they were at, he met them. He gave profound truth to the one who needed information, knowledge, Martha. And he gave great emotions and feeling to the one that needed a sense of love and understanding. That's what we need to do. Listen, empathize, and provide. To love Jesus is to become like Jesus. And to become like Jesus, this is the way we need to deal with people. Listen. Empathize. Provide for their needs as we're able. Would you join me in prayer?